after thinking it over, no, feeling it over, and then thinking it over, there were things I should have said as my husband was leaving for good. For good. Hmm. I don't think so. I could shrink the good down into a locket and wear it next to my heart, but even that little bit would break me. Yep. I should have said a lot of things. Like, we could start over. I'm still a great dancer. Oh, wait, your underwear's in the dryer. I hate you. The children, the children. I love you. I made you a cake. I'll make you laugh. Touch me. Please come back. But I didn't say anything. We had already said too much. Well, I guess this is uh, where I should open a vein in case I need to get an IV started later and spill some facts about how it all began. He's the first man I see that night as I pace the gallery. It's an opening for an exhibit of drawings by a group of sculptors. I look around the packed uh, gallery for anyone I know. Most of the crowd are Adam's family lookalikes, pallid, gangly men in black, and women with long, layered hair. They murmur without looking at each other or the drawings on the walls. Both sexes sway slightly as they sip wine, inhaling cigarette smoke deeply to accentuate waists that are cinched with thin, colorful belts. But I've already seen him. As chic as a 20s movie star, high cheekbones, face angular, tan, smooth, his shiny hair swings into his eyes and his up-tilted head catches the light. Among all the darkly clad people, he gleams so brightly in that first moment, he could be the sun outside a train window. Everyone and everything else are just scenery whizzing by. I notice he's wearing a scarf in summer, twisted around a slate gray shirt under a perfectly tailored creamy linen suit, a tall version of the little prince. There's a buzz coming from all the women around him. So I hear he comes from Germany, and his name is Tobin Kleinherz. But the secret name I give him is Wears Scarves in Summer. Oh my god. Looking back, especially at the good, is more painful than I'd imagined. Though there was nothing in between seeing Tobin and falling for him. Love was a parrot on my shoulder, repeating his name. Did I fail to see some sign that we would end badly, like a flock of crows or snakes crawling along the sidewalk? Now I'm standing here, between the before and after of love. Not a good spot, I know, but here I am. And a freshwater lake is out there in front of me. We were love. We were ships. Our bodies, fragile boats, are afloat. Water seeps into the carved out part of his chest. My belly, our thighs, how we rise and fall together. Our skin illumined from above and from each other. We stretch limbs like masts. Bed linens taut to catch the wind, to carry us from certain shore. We push off each other, setting ravens free. Love and water for days and nights. A dove returns with a twig in its beak, a sign that land, though unwelcome, is almost in sight. Tobin and I were married in a church on a hill in Lake Forest, Illinois. The wedding was a misty June day in the beginning of the 80s. Soon everything will be all wrong. Marriage is a high-flying risk, dizzying and invigorating as diving through clouds or throttling a car at full speed. You are socially, legally, economically, sexually totally joined to one person. A person you choose in sickness and in health, but the priest didn't say in misery, did he? A few years after we married and into the marriage, I realized that Tobin has stopped stroking my hair. 
Then he graduates to never calling me by name, unless he's asking me to pick up his dry, dry cleaning. Our children, Sparkly Ellender and Cuddly Marcus, don't seem to know anything that's going on until Tobin is watching a public television show. It's a series on World War II, a subject on which he is obsessed. I come into the room. Tobin, I have to talk to you. No answer. The children's daycare has to be paid by tomorrow. Background rumbling of weapons of destruction. We're three months late. No answer. And more artillery sounds from electric box in front of German husband. Tobin. He turns up the box. The children run into the room to see what the noise is. Tobin grabs the nearest lamp and hurls it to the ground. More loud noise and shattering of glass. The children stare. He picks up the television and stands over me as I cower, not the most dignified of positions, especially in front of the children. Television is about to turn my brain into rot. In an odd and electrified moment, we both know he's going to kill me in front of our two children. Of course, he doesn't kill me, but our love dies. How to poison. I'm sure there are shelves and shelves of books that deal with how to inform children that their parents are splitting up. There must be books that outline a way to do it gently and with the least amount of harm. Maybe Tobin and I should have read one. All I know is that the children, Ellender, age eight, and Marcus, age seven, are frozen on the landing of the stairs when I come home. They look at me as if I'm an, an intruder. Daddy told us not to worry that you're getting divorced. Ellender yells at me. Marcus, Marcus plugs his ears, screaming, I don't want to talk about it. Is it true, Mommy? Ellender cries. Is it? An explosion inside me goes nowhere. I want to send out comfort, but right now the children seem like an investment gone bad. I can only say this. You can try as hard as you can to fool yourself, but you are not in divorce mode until the children know. And once they do, everything that follows will leave bite marks. After. In lieu of morphine, there's chocolate. I devour it, try not to. Getting out of bed is the equivalent of miles of brisk walking. I feel paralyzed. I need to see the humor. I have no money. No car, no toilet paper. I slog through snow like Julie Christie in Dr. Zhivago, but instead of getting to Omar, I reach a nearby restaurant and steal the extra roll of toilet paper. More than half my bed is covered with open books, occupying roughly the same amount of space Tobin would have. I skim and switch between them, then settle into one all night long, whenever I forget that beds are for resting, for sleeping, for making love. Reading is my substitute for sleep and my consolation prize for being alone. Sometimes I stay in bed all day long. Just enough guilt gives me the energy to shout into the kitchen where my children are milling around. I'll get up soon and, and make dinner. What are we having, they chorus. Kids, I don't know. Let me rest for a minute. My definition of motherhood your child slits your jugular, laps up every lickable drop of blood, then with ruddy cheeks, he or she scoots off to college, saying to your inert form on the floor, thanks for everything. <laughs>